Good evening. This is the virtual okay. board selection meeting for Monday, March 30th. At this time, all participants uh, will be muted and the meeting will be closed to new attendees. As indicated on tonight's agenda, we will be inviting people uh, for public comment towards the end of the meeting. Uh, to get in line to speak, you must send an email to tech at harwichfire.com. That email address and the telephone number to utilize uh, is on the agenda packet. Uh, requests uh, sent to that email will be taken in the order that they are received. Uh, those emails may be sent at any time, by the way. You can send those right now if you want. Mr. Valentine, the meeting is yours, sir. Thank you, Scott. I'd like to call to order the uh, March 30th, 2020 Harwich Board of Selectmen's meeting. I'll take a roll call of who's in, uh, attending tonight's meeting. Uh, start with you, Don. I'm here. Ed. Here. Steve. Here. Steve. Michael. I'm here. I'm here. And we also have in attendance tonight uh, Danny DeCosta from the FinCom Finance Committee. And uh, I'll turn it. We'll start the uh, meeting then with old business and. Uh, uh, Joe Powers, the interim uh, town administrator, is here. I must mention that Megan Eldridge, our health director, is also on tonight's uh, video conferencing uh, board seconds meeting. Uh, Joe, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, everybody. And uh, believe me when I say it's my pleasure to now turn it directly over to our public health director, uh, who can give you a better um, update on COVID-19 actions than I can at this point. So. Megan, it's all yours. Hi, everybody. Um, I've got a few updates since I talked to you last on Friday. Um, as we talked last week, the, per the Department of Public Health requests that we stop reporting town by town level on the case counts. Um, today's update shows an increase in the number of positive cases in Barnstable County to 173. Our statewide total is at 5,752 with a total of 56 deaths related to COVID. Locally, I can tell you that we are seeing an increase in the number of cases on a daily basis. Um, the cases so far have not been related to one another and some don't have any known origin yet, uh, which means it's a, we call that a community spread, um, which is different from traveling um so we we don't know where it's coming from within our community which is why it's important to maintain your social distance and your hand hygiene and um, washing your hands and covering your coughs our visiting nurse association and the department of public health are working to find the epidemiologic connections to trace back the sources of infections of these unknown cases however those investigations do take quite a bit of time um, and right now they're, they're, they're working more on active cases in their close contacts rather than um, trying to figure out where the infection may have come from to begin with. We've had a lot of requests for providing addresses and cases, case numbers from the general public. Um, and the message to everyone is the same. It, it doesn't matter if you know the address of the positive case. You can only be responsible for your own actions and everyone must adhere to the social distancing guidelines. Be responsible for your own personal hygiene and regularly wash your hands. Other updates, Governor Baker enacted the stay at home advisory last week to communicate the importance of only leaving home for essential needs. This limits the casual contact with others in person to person at the grocery store and will reduce your risk for exposure and in turn reduce the risk of spreading the infection. We should expect an update from Governor Baker tomorrow on possibly further extending that uh, social distancing from April 7th through the end of the month, just as President Trump did. Um, and we should also get an update from the governor on the list of essential businesses that are considered essential to stay open and those that are, are non-essential. Um, we also have publicly requested that people traveling into the state self-quarantine for 14 days. 
Uh, this isn't a requirement, it's more of a request at this point. Um, it recognizes that the tri-state area is considered a hot spot and the infection rate is very high. Um, we acknowledge that people from the area of these hot spots are returning to their Cape homes a little earlier than usual due to the health crisis. And this fact has prompted a few calls and emails from residents. Um, please note that we are not considering a door-to-door -door campaign to inform any households with an out-of-state plate or um, going to leaflet cars that are out-of-state. Um, that's just not, it's not effective. The best defense we have is to act as if everyone's infected. This way you protect yourself from the virus. Not everyone from New York is carrying the virus and not every year round resident is free of the virus. So it doesn't discriminate. Uh, the virus is here, it's on Cape Cod and it's in Harwich. Um, it's been here for a couple of weeks now and will continue to spread if we don't heed the public health guidance of social distancing and frequent hand washing. Um, a few last things. We do not have a shelter in place order, um, but it is highly recommended to stay home unless you need essential items like food, medicine to go out for exercise or if you are an employee at an essential job. The virus doesn't move, people move it. So that's why it's very important to stop giving the virus a ride on our hands back into our cars and into our homes. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions of the selectmen and I want the public to know that I'll be on the call for public comment later on. Thanks. Thank you, Megan. Uh, I know in other areas of the country there's concern about uh, hospital beds and ICUs and how, how are we faring on Cape Cod? Last I've heard from Cape Cod Hospital is that they're doing pretty well. Um, a few people that have been in and out of the emergency room and inpatient say that they're not not all that busy inside the hospital. Um, they're triaging patients outside the hospital and really wondering if you really need to go in and be an inpatient or not. Um, if you need to be tested, they're not testing you inside the hospital. They're giving you an order and having you do that outside. Um, we do have several places in town that we have offered through the, the owners of the establishments to offer a surge capacity. So right now it's it hasn't been inactive, but we have thought about that and we do have plans if and when that is needed. Okay. Thank you, Megan. It's always good to have plans. Does anyone else have questions or comments for Megan? Uh, Larry, I have a question. This is Don. Don? Uh, Megan, I, I'm not sure how to put this, but. I understand people have second homes here, but has there been any guidance from uh, Beacon Hill over the idea of people uh, renting places earlier this year? Because I've seen that going on, uh, especially, like I don't mean just a person running their house. I mean, like the Belmont and some other places are, are still renting rooms right now. So the list of essential businesses that are allowed to operate through the governor's office includes real estate. Um, I'm not sure if their intent was seasonal rentals or vacation rentals. Um, we may see some more guidance on that tomorrow as far as um, updating their list of essential services. I don't think locally we can eliminate that. Um, we can strongly discourage it. People shouldn't be coming here to shelter in place. Um, but again, you can only be responsible for your own action. And so whether the house next door is rented or not, you should be social distancing and maintaining that um, that barrier between you. Yeah, but I'm not saying it to be mean-spirited or to worry about who's next door to me. I'm concerned about uh, surge capacity from the hospital because it wasn't designed uh, you know, for people to pack into the Cape to get treated. Right. I know I understand that this time of year, we don't have our traveling nurses. We don't have our extra doctors. We don't have that that we, we usually get in July and August. Um, so it's maybe something that we can consider um, right now. It hasn't been something on the table, though. Thanks. Any other questions? Megan, 
Yeah. Excuse me, Megan, it's Steve Ford. Um, I, just a quick question. Do you know where, where we are on the availability of testing on the Cape? Last I know, testing is widely available with a doctor's order. Um, whether you're a Cape Cod healthcare patient or you're an outer Cape health patient, there shouldn't be, as far as I know, a, a shortage of testing. It's just you need to meet certain criteria, um, which pretty not, right now is pretty broad. It's not just you've traveled or you have a fever. It's, um, it's, it's if you have any symptoms of COVID. Um, as far as I know, that the tests are available with a doctor's order. Okay, great. Thank you, Megan. Other questions for Megan? Thanks again, Megan, for all your work on this. It's a, a great experience, I assume, but we hopefully it won't last forever. It is the great uh, public health experience for sure. Thanks, Larry. <laughs> That's it. Uh, moving on then, uh, Joe, do you have more to say about the uh, COVID-19 before we move on to the next items? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, Megan, as usual, has done a great job uh, capturing everything. Um, and she's done that today on our department head meetings and throughout the day. So I think her update is, uh, is um, perfect as it stands. Um, the next item that you have, Mr. Uh, Chairman and members of the board, this is the concept that uh, we had talked about last week. I know that you have item C, that uh, item C is gonna be held off until Wednesday evening. So item B now is a discussion that was started by the finance director. I know she joins us on the call and that's why we've asked to have the uh, chairman of the finance committee present. The, um, the agenda item speaks to um, non-discretionary spending. We've uh, since updated that concept to more along the lines of um, non-essential non-payroll uh, spending and so, at this point, I know the board should have received a memo, a memorandum from the finance director. So I will, at this point, turn the call over to her, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Joe. Good uh, evening, everyone. Good evening. Shall I go, Larry, or would you like? Uh, yeah, please, uh, go ahead. Okay. Um, so as as you may be aware, um, the, um, the prior, it, town administrator and I were asked to be more aggressive on estimating revenues in the current fiscal year. And so we comply. However, um, we know that revenues are not going to co come in where we originally estimated them. Um, we have about $15 million um, to collect in real estate bills. And um, the governor has brought forward um, a bill um, that has yet to be voted on, but that would allow for municipalities to waive late payments on um, on real estate taxes, um, in addition to um, extension of the due date to June 1st. So the town of Harwich, as many other municipalities or all other municipalities, um, um, records its financial transactions in accordance with GAAP. It's a modified accrual basis of accounting. And such revenues are not recognized until, sorry, um, revenues are not recognized until they're received. So it doesn't matter that a real estate bill went out as far as um, our financial transactions are concerned and, and our, um, the way we generate revenue, it's not until um, somebody pays their taxes. So do I think that everyone in Harwich is not going to pay their taxes? No, not at all. But we have some other considerations that we need to think about. Um, we have tw about $20 million remaining unexpended of the $69 million um, appropriation. Three million of that is set aside for debt. Four million is remaining in salaries and wages. One and a half million is in employee benefits. We haven't received the funding for the tornado yet. So my concern is that we um, look at our resources and we start thinking about what is it going to cost us to, to manage or um, the challenges that are um, surrounding this virus. Yes, there'll be some, um, some of those costs that are going to be covered, but I don't think all of them are going to be covered. And so my concern is I want to make sure 
that the taxpayers in Harwich are, um, are that we're thinking about them, that we're thinking about all the people that perhaps um, have been furloughed or, or even the ones that have lost their positions. And I just want the board to have a conversation about what does it mean if, if we move forward and said non-essential costs, um, we are, we are not going to be incurred. Thank you, Carol. Uh, to me, that seems like an obvious step. Uh, Joe, how do we, would we proceed on that? Is that just a, a board action or do you do that as interim uh, town administrator? Well, I think in this case, it's um, it, it would be proper for the board to have the discussion that Carol just mentioned. And if I'll refer you to her memorandum dated today, where the first option that she has listed is, I, I think is a is a good first step. She's on, uh, outlined there that the board considered uh, institute a budget freeze for all non-essential spending, which is defined as non-payroll costs outside the areas of public health and safety. So the board will recall that I had implemented a, a hiring freeze related to the budget process for fiscal year 20 back on February 6th. That is still in place. And I think it's appropriate for the board tonight to discuss what um, I, I would offer as a recommendation in concert with the finance director. And that is that the board this evening consider instituting a budget freeze for all non-essential spending. Again, defining that as non-payroll costs outside of the areas of public health and safety. I think that's a discussion that should happen tonight, Mr. Chairman, and I think it's a good first step. And Larry, uh, just to, uh, just to uh, let, me just, uh, see, let me just clarify, in terms of uh, hiring freeze, does that also include uh, seasonal workers? So the hiring freeze that was implemented on February 6th was for any positions that had not previously been um, advertised. So it's, uh, it's very broad in its scope and um, it hasn't been reduced. So it would, I would at this point say it would cover all seasonal as well. Uh, Steve, I'm sorry, I cut you off. No problem. Uh, Joe, could you put a little uh, more definition around what uh, you and Carol are defining as non-essential? Well, I'm gonna defer to Carol first and then I'd like to weigh in, but um, my short answer is we, we need to start from a position of no. Um, and then have work back from there for uh, collaborative discussions to, to make sure it is absolutely essential at this time. But I'll, um, I'll defer to Carol. I, mean, I agree with Joe, but, um, but I think that we could think about things um, on, in a different manner. So let's say a department had budgeted to replace a printer, but their printer is still working. And there, I, I believe that's a... Um, uh, not an essential cost that they need to incur at this point in time. So I, that would be a no to me. So that's just an example. Certainly COA, we're going we're gonna to continue to fund um, Council on Aging because that's part of public health um, and in areas like that, such as the transfer station, because that's also um, um, speaks to the health of the community. Do we, do we uh, if I may, Larry, um through you, do we have any sense of the kind of savings we would engender as a result of this, or is it, uh, you know, just uh, catch as catch can, uh, finding areas that we can uh, uh, not move ahead with expenditures, uh, with the knowledge that maybe at some point down the road we would do that? Is there any is there any sense of what we could say? Hi, uh, this is Dana. I, I have a potential answer for that. Please. Go ahead, Dana, then we'll put Carol on again. Sure. Um, I just added up all of the expenses that were budgeted for this year, and um, it came to $11,800,000 million, million as far as just expense accounts, not talking salary wages, not talking all the things that go into the other accounts, uh, but just expenses. And um, of that, there are certain ones that are just going to happen anyways, the state assessments, the Bonsable County Retirement, Cape Cod Commission, the Bonsable County Assessments, OPEB. Um, I took out thinking that uh, it would also cover uh, police and fire expenses, um, 
the Finance Committee Reserve Fund is under that account, um, vacation and sick leave, buyback, Medicare. So if you take all those things out, um, that takes about 5,956,000 out, and that leaves about um, 5 million eight hundred and fifty thousand for the whole year now i don't know what of that has been spent you got to assume that at least half of that's already been spent sure. um so um you're talking maybe three quarters of it is spent maybe carol could get better numbers on that but you're talking between two and three million dollars that's probably potentially still out there in the accounts that aren't going to be spent anyways the kind of accounts that that um, just so going to go forward and I didn't touch any of the salary and wages. There are probably a few um, dollars that could be picked up there in terms of overtime or something like that where people are not working um, as much in, in certain departments that might um, cut that number down a little bit. But I just looked at expenses and that's kind of what I came up with as far as what is potentially available. Now, Carol, do you wish to weigh in? Uh, Mr. Chairman, could I, do you mind if I speak next? Uh, who's this? Sorry, that's Joe. Hey, Joe? Yeah, please. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, cause I, I want to make sure I, I heard this correctly, but if there was, if the chairman, sorry, the previous speaker's comments were about personnel at the end of his comments, I, I, I don't think we're in a position to go there yet. Um, I, I heard a comment, I think, about staff that's available or jobs that aren't being done. Um, I just want to make sure that tonight we're talking about uh, spending uh, not related to personnel costs. Yeah, that was just in the category of overtime if there was not overtime being expended in some areas. That's all. Um, Thank I, you. I wasn't looking at any salary stuff at all. Thank you. Larry, this is Don. Don, please. I, yeah, I want to take a slightly different approach, but I, 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 I mean, it's similar to what Stephen was doing trying to get my arms around this. Are we talking about this being across all funds or is this more like uh, tax derived funds? Because we, we've gotten ourselves over the last 10 or 15 years into revolving accounts, uh, enterprise funds, uh, I mean, golf, harbors. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things out there. Even Reckon Youth has like, uh, big money. I believe the number if I recall correctly, for the revolving funds, it was like a million dollars. But I'm not sure we could, that would help us if we didn't spend it. I'm not sure whether that could be recovered. You know, it, so, uh, for, um, that raises a good point, uh, Carol. Are those funds protected or can we uh, use that, the same criteria? Um, hi, so the, the revolving funds would be protected. They can only be used for the purpose in which they the, the funds were received. Um, but this, I think what Dana um, was reviewing is the operating budget. So this is what goes to town meeting is appropriated at town meeting. Um, as of Friday, um, 20 million remained unexpended. But as I said, 3 million is encumbered for debt service, 4 million is for salaries and wages, one and a half million is for benefits. Um, we have to cover the 850,000 for the tornado because we don't know when that when those funds are going to come in from the state and they need to come in before the end of the fiscal year. So um, I can certainly put together um, information for the board uh, with regard to any remaining, you know, more of an exact number of any remaining dollars that don't include areas like public safety or health or, um, or you know, council on aging, things of that nature, if that would be helpful for you. That, that would be great, Carol, if you would. Through you again, Mike, to Carol. I, I just want to clarify this for the public's uh, edification here. We're not talking about something that's already been an incurred liability. We're talking about uh, not incurring a future liability. Is that correct? I mean, we're just not going to age invoices, uh, I guess is what I'm driving at. That's correct. It's for, for you, future purpose purchases that have not already been um uh, you know issued a purchase order of things of that nature okay. i agree with uh, steve that would be good uh ed uh any any word in your connections with the tornado money that's actually uh voted on and appropriate i think or agreed to at least 
No, uh, they keep on, they continue to have discussions, um, uh, but with no uh, specific course of action laid out. And I think uh, this, uh, uh, the events of the last month are, are making it uh, all the more uh, slow to have those conversations because they're sucking, sucking up all the air in the room so to speak um but i'll uh, renew a round of uh contacts uh, tomorrow okay thank you i did uh read today that the uh what do you call the recent 2.2 .2 trillion dollars that was a uh, uh, pass and going out uh did not include uh funding to the states and that's one of the considerations they're talking about another uh uh, bill, and so uh, that's a little disheartening. I was hoping there'd be some there for the states, and, also, and obviously I hope too that if it were to come from the states, some of that would roll down to the local communities, <laughs> which doesn't always happen, it seems. Uh, Michael, you have a comment on this before we uh, move on? No, Larry, I'm all spent. Uh, Ed, how about this Here? particular act? No, that's fine. Mr. Uh, Chairman? Dana? Um, the only other comment I would make, I guess, is that, um, you know, most, most departments are, are a season ahead, so a lot of departments are getting ready for summer that would uh, think about that. Um, and I guess that's the only thing that you guys would have to really think about in terms of making some sort of decision is to have some sort of escape clause in there where department heads could appeal to you in, in terms of... Uh, I'm just thinking of, say, the golf course, if they haven't bought their pre-emergent crabgrass control or something like that um, for the summer, if you're not anticipating any golf this summer, then you would say, no, you deny that one. But if you were thinking that they're going to play golf later, it's a lot more expensive to get rid of that later. So some, and that's just a, a stupid example, but I'm thinking that there would be some departments that may want to come before you to at least appeal something um and and it might make sense as a town to do something if, if that is so i would just suggest that if you're gonna have some sort of blanket order that you make it reviewable and you make some sort of way for department heads to petition you i guess that's my only comment uh, my my opinion on that is that this is a board action and so we can uh, take a, another board action change if circumstances change Larry? Yes. Um, I, I, I tend to agree with Dana. Um, I think that we should, if, if we're going to make this motion or, or take this action, I think we need to let Carol and Joe know that, it, that there should be some sort of appeals process for the department heads. If, you know, I don't, I don't want to be a hard and steady no, uh, and I think that the board should be able to at least hear an appeal if somebody has one that makes sense. Mr. Chairman, um, Dana, again, um, if you think back to this advice you gave to the schools just last week, um, you know, you said to look at the reserves. Um, we have a, a stabilization account with over $4 million in it, at least as a backstop for some things. And the comment was that if you have an emergency, well, if this isn't an emergency, then what is? So at least thinking wise, you have some sort of backstop if you need it. I'm not suggesting that we use it yet, but um, at least you have it if you need it. And you have a mechanism within the annual warrant to to, to use it. So um, just parroting on your advice from last week to the schools, uh, that's something to keep in mind as you go forward. Mr. Chair, uh, this is Don. I, 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 before this goes sideways, I, I agree with Joe. The default position should be no, and the appeal should follow. I mean, but everybody should should be hear, hearing no first. That would uh, that would be my point. That uh, people always have a chance to appeal. I would not want to make that strong. Otherwise, we'll tie everyone. So appeal everything will be appealed because everyone wants to do their best job. Mr. Chairman. Hey, this is your interim administrator. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, and thank you to Selectman Howell. Again, uh, the request is that the board um, 
uh, if the board is so inclined, that you institute the budget freeze for all non-essential spending defined as non-payroll costs outside of the areas of health and safety. And that within that, there, there is already a mechanism in place. The finance director, uh, myself as interim town administrator, uh, Bob Lawton and uh, Griffin Ryder as procurement, we're constantly having these discussions. And I would hope that if the board sets the standard that in this emergent crisis right now, that it's understood by departments and the town that we're taking a very critical eye towards our financial situation. Because the other point I wanna bring up is we're not thinking about um, seasonal yet. We're not thinking about the summer. We're thinking literally day to day. And we're thinking about four o'clock when the numbers change and the numbers are going up. And so what we're trying to convey in the immediate short term, which is why this board is meeting three times this week and at least two times next week, is so that there's an ability to react quickly to what is changing on a daily basis. So again, the, uh, the, the point I think that uh, the finance director brought to bear last week is correct. It's properly before the board this evening. And I think it's appropriate if the board were to initiate that, that you direct staff to evaluate it understanding that we've always had a mechanism in place by which the board is the final arbiter or the final say. And so I think we can still do that in the manner that we've done it before, but we need to get a sense of urgency out into the world that um, we're operating on an emergency basis on a day by day basis. I'll certainly entertain a motion to that effect if anyone so chooses. Yeah, I'll give it a shot, Larry, this is Don. I move that we impose an immediate freeze on all non-essential future expenditures, uh, and that only, uh, and that we will only be approving uh, future liabilities and uh, uh, accruals against health and public safety. Joe, is there a second? Larry, Larry, Steve, it's Steve, it's Steve Ford. Joe, does that reflect what you were trying to do? Well, I, I appreciate the sentiment. I, if I can just, uh, um, I think it's appropriate to say a budget freeze for all non-essential spending, effective immediately, excluding non-payroll costs uh, uh, and excluding uh, essential costs and non-payroll costs. That's a, lot well, longer God, you... That's a lot longer than I was saying, but I'll, I'll accept that as the motion that I'm making. Is there a if, I may, I, if, if there's a second, I believe the finance director and I We'll be able to interpret that based on her memo. Yeah. All right, so moved. Larry? Yes, Michael. Could someone repeat the motion? My uh, internet connection cut out and I didn't hear anything Joe said. Uh, Joe, Joe why don't you repeat it for Don? What Joe so said the, sounded more like my motion than my motion did. Uh, Joe, that the, will you repeat the board that institute, Yeah, that the board institute a budget freeze for all non-essential spending, excluding non-payroll costs and, no, I apologize. They're excluding uh, payroll costs. Thank you. They're excluding payroll costs and- For no, the all non-essential spending defined as non-payroll costs outside the areas of public health and safety. So again, yeah. initiate a budget freeze effective immediately for all non-essential spending defined as non-payroll costs outside the areas of public health and safety. Thank you. Um, if you could just, Joe, you started to speak after my concern about uh, departments being able to come back to the board with an appeal, or if it's just a flat no from you and Carol. What was the outcome of that? So Mr. Chairman, if I may speak to that, what, what I was getting to is, um, I think it's appropriate for the board first to initiate this action of a freeze. I think it's appropriate for the finance director, myself, and the procurement team to continue to evaluate procurements that are happening. And that if there is any decision that is uh, a party feels aggrieved to, we, could, we would still bring it to the board. I just didn't want it to be that an automatic no goes straight to the board. Uh, I think there's a, there's a process in place for procurements that have worked well in the, in the, uh, in the present, and I think we can utilize that in this manner going forward. 
recognizing that the board is meeting more regularly. So we'll have more opportunities to get these in front of you. But that staff be allowed to make a determination first. Mr. Chair, Thank you. this is Don again. Uh, there's, there's no second so far, but what I am suggesting is uh, if it does get seconded uh, and we move forward with this, that we, we're meeting two or three times a week. It's not hard to conceive of taking up a, a hardship exemption, but Joe's right. I think we need to impose this across the board uh, with those exclusions and start from that point and not just presume that we're going to uh, make this a porous motion. If I can add, Mr. Chairman, I also misspoke or misspoke by omission. In this particular action, I think it's also appropriate that the public health director be involved in the decision making because what we're talking about is a determination as to whether or not something is essential. Well, the essential nature of it really derives first from the crisis. And so that's what I'm talking about. The finance director, myself, the health director, the uh, uh, interim assistant administrator, there's a team in place to evaluate spending in the immediacy in relation to the crisis. So I think we have uh, the the right people in place to make the decisions if the board imposes this freeze, which I think is proper. Okay. Michael, did that answer your question? It did. I'm gonna second the motion for discussion. And I do have one more thing, but I do second Don's motion. Okay, motions are made and seconded. Michael, I'll go back to you then. Um, the hiring freeze, uh, the, the police, the, the two positions I spoke about during budget time, police dispatcher and the uh, patrolman, has any has any more thought been given to that and does this affect that? And the reason I ask is if it does, I'd like to have an understanding of what's being spent on overtime with the lack of those two positions, especially the dispatcher. Joe, do you have a response to that or do we need, need to follow, follow up on that? Well, I mean, my first response would be that the board, uh, we've talked several times over the last several weeks about the hiring freeze. Um, the board will recall that I was prepared to lift it on Saturday, March 7th. Um, I, I think it's fortuitous that we hadn't, but um, I do think that hiring freeze uh, is worthy of a, a discussion and perhaps as early as this week to to reformat that in light of the um, the coronavirus emergency as well. Um, obviously, we need to be mindful of hiring decisions in the short term because of the impacts financially, but I think it's appropriate for the board to have a broader discussion on that to, to reshape the hiring freeze, if you will, in concert with what we're doing in regard to the current health crisis. Uh, Joe, you've confused me a little bit because I thought you were part of this or maybe it's a separate statement you are now uh, putting forth a hiring freeze on, on all uh, full-time and seasonal employees at the moment. So my, uh, my statement on that, Mr. Chairman, is that the hiring freeze uh, is in effect and it is broadly in effect. If the board is looking for that to be reshaped, I think it should be at the board level. But this, this my agenda item this evening, I don't think allows for that discussion and um, given the lack of notice. So, Michael, we can come back to that? Yeah, as long as we come back to that, like I said, those are the two positions related to safety. And given the uh, coronavirus, I think that we need to be, we need to be very concerned um, in the police and fire and losing police and fire personnel or potentially losing police and fire personnel when we're already short staffed, especially again on the dispatch level. I have not heard from the chief as far as the, um, you know how important that that next patrolman is uh, with one one going out, but certainly being down a dispatcher with the thought of being down any more people in the department, I have concern over not just being able to fill that spot, um, and also I have concern over overtime in that in, in the department based on that. So as long as we have the conversation, I'm fine with it for tonight. Okay. Any other comments? Larry, questions? Larry, C4, uh, to follow up on, on uh, Michael's comment, are we able to get that on the agenda then for one of the next meetings? Um, I think uh, April 1st is probably, uh, that's Monday, uh, Friday, Let's see, April 1st is Wednesday, we possibly do it for Friday. We yeah, still I mean, just to, yeah just, just to Michael's point, I mean, it is, 
you know, vitally important. The, the stress and strain that's going to come on the police and fire as we go forward with this crisis is, is going to be significant, whether we want to believe it or not. So um, I think the sooner we address that, uh, Michael's issue, I think it is very important. Uh, Joe, for yours. I was just going to say, we do have time to get that on the uh, agenda for Friday. Um, okay. I, I, I would like to refine the question before then, though, uh, simply because if we're talking about um, hiring as a response to the effects of coronavirus, um, I think that's a completely different discussion. There are any number of things that we need to draw upon, uh, both federal and state that have come out on personnel uh, as it relates to coronavirus and impacting on personnel. Um, what I heard and what I think I heard earlier was a discussion about there may be positions that have been already vacated that in the normal course of events may have already been filled except for the coronavirus. So I, I, I do want to refine the message if we could for Friday uh, to make sure that we're talking about uh, filling positions that need to be filled rather than framing it in the uh, position of uh, if, if we expect impacts to public safety or others based on the virus. Larry? Yes, Michael. Just so I'm clear, I'm talking about filling two positions that were currently being paid when we did the, when we did that, when, when the, when the uh, interim town administrator recommended the hiring freeze. So those positions were filled one was a retirement or not a retirement, one, one left and one went out, I believe, on disability. So both of those were being paid in the current budget. Then we put the hiring freeze on and chose not to fill them through the budget process, which is now delayed. So this has nothing to do with the coronavirus, though to Steve's point, I do believe there's gonna be added stress. So I, I think it was good, a good mention, but I think we need to be at full strength in our dispatch, full strength in our police department, and full strength in our fire department, and fill the positions that were already filled in this budget. And then, then we can talk about the rest of it. But those two positions, as I mentioned in the budget hearings, they are in this budget. We put a hiring freeze on and they were delayed to fill again. And my request is that the board votes to fill those now. Joe, could you draft something for the April 1st meeting? Uh, it would be for April 3rd, but I can. And then, Gabe, I can just ask, can, April 3rd, the, I'm sorry. Yeah, can the positions be identified this evening? Um, I think you need to talk to, if I may, Larry, talk to the chief about which position in the patrolman side of it it is. Uh, but I believe one of the uh, patrolmen went out on disability and that that spot is open and the other one is a dispatcher for the police department um Thank gabrielle parker went to another resigned and went to another department so that is an open dispatch position uh, you'll need a definition from the chief on the whether it's a patrolman or a detective but um, i believe it's a patrolman thank you well and we'll have that for friday april 3rd's meeting the agenda for april 1st that we had our had to have already been posted before this meeting right yeah okay my mistake, I knew uh, Friday was the third. Is there any other comments, questions on the uh, motion? Mr. Second? A couple of things, Larry. Go ahead, Ed. Um, so as I understand the motion, it's, it's defining all expenses within health and safety to be essential and all expenses outside of health and safety to be non-essential. Doesn't cover payroll. I'm frozen. I did. Yeah, not 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 including but, but payroll. Not including personnel. Correct. Yeah. So the, then the question is, how are we defining health and safety? Is it a, a group of departments, or is it a group of activities? Well, I think Carol gave us a little bit of that in terms of the police and fire, but also counsel on aging. Uh, you know, those essential what we would be considered uh, safety activities. So I, I'll let Joel speak to it, but it seemed like it's more on activities than it was departments at this point. Well, Mr. Chief, I see that the finance director's microphone is ready. 
So I'll defer to Carol at this point. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I think that you would have to define it on activities. So if we need to purchase some technology so folks can continue to do their job, and that's essential for um, the government, then those would be considered essential expenses. So I think it is definitely based on activities rather than particular departments. Okay. So uh, presumably if uh, uh, there's an accident and, and uh, some significant piece of our traffic control system is knocked down, uh, the Public Works Department will go ahead and restore that uh, uh, that equipment as uh, because of the safety implications that leaving it out of out of uh, out of uh, operation would cause. I concur, sir. Yep. Okay. Um, and and then I guess the other issue is you know with the hiring freeze. You put a higher increase in because you don't know really what what's happening in the future, and whether it, and and whether or not when the hiring freeze is put in, you uh, uh, a, a position is, is filled, um, and then it becomes unfilled due to retirement or disability or or uh, or, or or what whatever. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't exclude that position from the hiring freeze. That's you. 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 Uh, a hiring freeze is meant to catch those, catch the savings of those types of occurrences as you go forward until whatever condition you're looking at stabilizes. So I don't think that's. Um, uh, uh, Fleckman McCaskill's comment on, on those two positions being filled when the hiring freeze went in and budgeted for, they should be continued on on that basis. I think if we're going to continue them on, it's because they're, they're in essence essential, necessary personnel for the, the safety of the, of the town, not because they had already been budgeted. You put the hiring freeze in uh, because even though you had budgeted for you, you feel that you need to uh, reap some savings until such time as you you understand what the financial future is. In this case, you know we we might want to really reap the savings of of of, of not filling two positions, but as um, Count Selectman McCaskill indicates these are probably uh, going forward and given the situation we're facing going to be essential positions and that's the reason why we should look at uh, filling them uh, even though there is a hiring freeze. Uh, uh, Joe I'll leave it to you to bring it back to the uh, to the board uh, after talking to the police chief uh, but uh, those two positions and uh, their need going Understood. forward. Understood. Any other comments? Uh, if not, all in favor? I'll take a roll call. Uh, Michael? Aye. Ed? Aye. Don? Aye. Steve? Aye. And I'm I, Larry. So it's uh, passed. Joe will uh move thank you very much we have a couple back uh, additional actions then to take uh i think uh joe i'm going to turn it back to you for the next agenda item thank you mr chairman is rescheduling uh, uh, correct as i mentioned item c is actually going to be the primary agenda item for your meeting on wednesday april 1st at 6 30. uh we know that the uh, town clerk will be a presenter we believe the moderator will be a presenter and John Giorgio will also be a presenter. And that is a discussion of uh, potentially rescheduling the uh, 2000, uh, 2020 annual town meeting and the 2020 uh, annual town election or any other actions therein. So that'll be the primary item for Wednesday evening. 
the only other item under old business is just a recap of the modified uh, meeting schedule that we discussed, which would be uh, Wednesday at 6.30, Friday, April 3rd at 6.30. And uh, looking at Tuesday, April 7th at 6.30, um, what I would ask, however, is um, to get a sense from the board, uh, perhaps on Wednesday, uh, based on what Governor Baker may be saying tomorrow. The April 7th meeting was uh, scheduled as such to try and leverage uh, the governor's uh, actions on his um, order number 13, uh, but that might, um, that, might, uh, that might come as soon as tomorrow. So we are definitely on for Wednesday and Friday of this week, and I'd ask for a little flexibility for next week uh, to respond to events. Okay. Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, Larry, Larry, Larry uh, I put it. Uh, Steve? Yeah, uh, in relation to uh, Steve, uh, I, I believe that, uh, I don't know who's got, somebody's got a Somebody mic. Somebody has some. Uh, yeah. Um in relation to uh, C, uh, and I believe that uh, Joe and um, Anita received a uh, email from the moderator, uh, Mike Ford, that uh, as it sits right now, the selectmen are the ones who will decide whether we push off our uh, annual town meeting and push off the uh, election as well. Um, it Until the point in time where the uh, warrant is published and we've signed it, we still have the authority to extend out the date uh, for town meeting and for the town election. Uh, my, I, I believe my brother is able to uh, be part of the call, but uh, I'm not positive of that. And uh, it's not that relevant at this point uh, because we are the ones who are gonna make the decision if we so decide prior to the printing of the warrant. So yes, as it relates to C and our discussion on Wednesday, um, it really is uh, up to the selectmen as to whether they want to extend out those dates. Mr. Chair, it's Don. Uh, Don? Uh, Go ahead, please. Steve, I, I, I understand what Steve's saying. I mean, yeah, the primary responsibility and authority is ours, but it would be a very lonely town meeting without the town clerk and without the moderator. So it has to be done in conjunction with everybody. So we, if we do kick it forward, which I think we're clearly going to do, at least for the town meeting, we have to know availabilities. Uh, we, it, it can't be done just because out of fiat, we've decided that we're going to do it. <laughs> well, I, if, if, I, if I may, Mr. Chair, I, I wasn't yes. suggesting that those people wouldn't participate. Uh, if I may, uh, uh, Dole's uh, wants to bring that back on Wednesday. I'd like to perform this discussion until Wednesday. Larry? Yes. Ed? Yeah. Um, if I could ask, um, uh, the legislation that the uh, Senate and House uh, passed can uh, cover this area of moving dates of elections in town meetings. Um, I was hopeful that uh, by uh, our meeting on Wednesday, we would be provided with copies of that material. Mr. Chairman, uh, Assistant, uh, excuse me, Assistant Interim Administrator can speak to that. Uh, go ahead, John. Uh, we received information from KP Law today on the special act that was adopted last week. So the board will have that on Tuesday in advance of your discussion on Wednesday. Uh, what you'll see in that legislation is the board may simply decide to uh, reschedule uh, uh, by a vote on Monday, excuse me, Wednesday evening without offering a date yet. You do have the ability to say you're going to reschedule without having a requirement of setting a date Wednesday. And to the previous speaker, the reason why I mentioned all the available presenters was if the board wanted to do any number of options, including reschedule for date specific, then there could be that discussion with all the principal players. So yeah. the uh, we were made aware of that special act law today. It will be part of your discussion and your packet materials for Wednesday. Thank you, Joe. 
Okay, we've talked about the meetings. Uh, there's nothing else on this. We have uh, nothing in old business. Uh, Joe, you're the start, and I will move back to you on uh, uh, the update on phase two. Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, what I'd like to do is bring you back to item number three, the open public forum. Um, the uh, I don't have any uh, phase two updates, and I was going to refer to the real power behind, and that is the public safety icon. So if you were willing to get into the open public forum at this point, I would defer to Lieutenant Tilsley. I am. Good evening. Uh, before we uh, open the meeting, uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, this is a new format for public discussion. Please try to be patient. A reminder to those calling in, use star six to mute and unmute your phone. And please uh, try to minimize any background noise. Um, I do have at this point uh, one person that uh, has emailed uh, in. I'll remind you that if you do want to speak, uh, you still have uh, we'll, we'll pause for two minutes, allow you to send an email to that email address on the agenda. And uh, after you do email, you can call in and we'll take those uh, callers in order. So again, I do have uh, one caller or one emailer at this point, and we'll take a two minute break just to allow them to dial in. And Scott, can you repeat that email address, though? Because if you don't have the agenda, that's no help. Yes, sir, I can. That's uh, tech, T-E-C-H, at harwichfire.com. And uh, I'm happy to report that uh, after the email work over the weekend, I was able to create a new email address that is somewhat more appropriate for the selectman's meeting. And that will be on the next agenda. So we'll pause for a bit to see, uh, to give a chance to call in. Sounds good. This reminds me of young Frankenstein. I expect someone to do a soft shoe dance with them. I don't know, Larry, I was thinking more of elevator music. Larry, I don't, uh, I don't see anybody uh, dialed in yet, so I'm going to share my screen for just a moment. I'm going to uh, see if I can get that phone number up on the screen just in case that uh, individual doesn't have it. Okay. Amazing technology. There you go. Could that be magnified a little bit? Let's see. While you're doing that, uh, I'll read the phone number uh, to call in. It's 786-535-3211. Is there any code they have to press or is it just that number? No, there's a code. Well, we've had uh, no one else uh, join the call, so uh, maybe that individual's question was answered in your discussion, and uh, we can move on at your discretion. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Uh, we'll move then next to uh, Selectman's reports. Uh, Ed? No. Steve? 
Uh, yeah, Larry, uh, just one other thing. I believe either in this new, uh, this legislation, chapter 39, section nine, which gives, uh, you know, us the power of uh, moving the um, town meeting uh, or in a soon to come piece of legislation that the governor has proposed, it also enables the selectmen uh, to lower the quorum for town meeting if we need to. So that's something we all ought to think about as we move forward here in case we're still in a situation where you don't want gatherings that are overly large and we still are gonna move ahead or need to move ahead with the town meeting. Uh, we, have, we will have the ability under what the governor has issued, uh, the power to lower the quorum. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Don? Nothing other than I wish everybody good health and continued uh, social distancing. <laughs> Michael? Uh, I'd just like to take the opportunity to again uh, thank Scott Tilsley. Um, he's doing an incredible amount of work outside of what his job actually is. Uh, at some point, I think we do need to take up, um, or, or sooner than later, need to take up the IT uh, position, job description, and what we are doing. Uh, and I would put that out there and ask for that to be, when things level out, another uh, agenda topic. But uh, thank you, Scott. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's excellent what you're doing, and I realize that um, you're doing all, a lot of this on your own time and uh, taking away from, from your job. And I thank you for it. Megan, thank you. You're on the front lines. Really appreciate everything you're doing and keeping us informed. And, and Joe, thank you for uh, keeping this together. Um, you, get, you get thrown in as an acting town administrator at a, at a crisis time. And certainly appreciate all the extra work. Thank you. I'm sure we all agree with those comments, Michael. I have nothing more to add. If there's no and uh, uh, Megan, my, and Joe and Scott, uh, Go home and rest. <laughs> my my sure direction. Thank you all. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Don. Don. Uh, I'll take a vote. Uh, Ed. I'll take a second first, but then I'll take a vote. Aye. Second. I'll second it. Okay. Uh, Ed. Aye. Ed. Aye. Michael. Aye. Steve. Aye. Don, you've already voted, I guess, but vote again. No, I did, but I'll say aye anyway. Okay. And I'm an aye, so uh, good evening. Stay safe. Thank you. Night. This conference is no.